Well, good afternoon if you are on the East Coast of the United States, or good morning if you're further west, or good evening if you are perhaps in Cape Town in South Africa or anywhere on the African continent or in most of Europe. And good morning and good overnight if you are further east in Asia, Australia, the Pacific Islands, people all over the world follow Fred Plotkin on Fridays on Adagio, which is the place where classical music happens. Adagio is a video and audio streaming platform dedicated to supporting artists and to making classical music and opera available to fans all around the world. And when I say all around the world, I mean all around the world. My guest today is someone I've been very much looking forward to speaking with. His name is Africa Milane, and he is the vice chairperson of the board of directors of the Cape Town Opera in Cape Town, South Africa. So Africa, welcome. It's lovely to be here, Fred. Thank you very much for inviting me. And isn't it magic that however many thousands of kilometers away we are from each other, we're able to connect uh, on such a wonderful Friday? That, well, it, it's evening in South Africa. Here it's still a sunny afternoon in New York City. <laughs> and uh, I realized, too, that here we are going into winter. Does that mean you're going into summer? Very much so. Uh, we are in the tail end of what is called fall in the United States. We call it autumn in uh, in South Africa. Um, in about four weeks or so, we'll be in the middle of uh, proper summer. Uh, so Cape Town, South Africa is a wonderful city to visit, by the way. Um, and I hope to, to, to host you here one day in the near future. <laughs> Very windy at the moment, but it's glorious, glorious days. So you say it's windy at the moment. This is one of the things, this is the many things about Cape Town, South Africa in general. Um, as I know you know, I have not been there. I have an incredible passion for South Africa and have for decades. One of my very dearest friends of many, many years is from South Africa, and I know she's watching now. And um, so I've learned all about it through her, but also many people I'm what's known as a pleasure activist and, and what mm. that may mean to different people are different things. But since I coined the term, I'll define it. It's people who activate their senses, people who live fully and experience things with their eyes, nose, mouth, hearing, touch, all the senses together that create intuition, instinct, that sixth sense. And from everything I know about South Africa, all the senses are activated. So when you talk about the wind in Cape Town, it's something I've heard about. Um, it's at the confluence of two oceans, if I'm correct. It is indeed. So we are obviously on the southern tip of the African continent. Uh, to our right, I suppose, is the uh, Atlantic Ocean, uh, which brings the cold Benguela uh, sort of uh, weather that comes with it. And then to our left uh, is the Indian Ocean that then goes all the way up, obviously, uh, the uh, east coast of the African continent. Uh, there's a wonderful attraction called the Cape Point, uh, which is a point in the peninsula that makes up the uh, metropole of Cape Town, uh, which is very, very popular. And you imagine these two vast oceans meeting. Um, Cape Town is also known for uh, stormy seas in uh, the outer areas, of course. It was called the Cape of Good Hope uh, mm -hmm. for many reasons by uh, travelers in the uh, 17th century uh, who were on the voyage from Europe all the way to India in part looking for spices and many other adventures. And this was a natural stop for them because, well, there was fresh water that was coming off the iconic Table Mountain. Um, and they planted a garden, which is called the Company's Garden after the Dutch East Indian Company, where then ships would, would um, dock in, uh, in Table Bay Harbor and then get fresh food fruit, uh, fruit um, water uh, and stocks, uh, refresh a little bit before they go on for, I imagine what would be weeks and weeks and weeks of being in the open ocean as they go to India. Uh, it's a very historical city. Um, we're only about 400 years old as, as a city, um, which like is New York. <laughs> pretty much, yeah. And, yeah. 
And, and to think that we're young in comparison to Istanbul, for example, or mm-hmm. Jerusalem, or those uh, iconic cities. Um, but the senses are activated in Cape yeah. Town. Right? You smell the city, uh, you taste it, you hear it. Um, I live in the city center, right in the heart of it. And uh, I can hear in the background an Ethiopian-owned hotel where karaoke is on at the moment. <laughs> there's a Lebanese hotel just to the other end of it. Um, there's a uh, an Ethiopian actually, so there's a lot of Ethiopia actually, another thing about it in Cape Town that is serving wonderful food. But then you've got a wonderful Japanese inspired restaurant called Fain, which is two blocks away. And and traffic, obviously. I mean, there's traffic. Mm-hmm. Now, when I think of the topography, and you were also talking about water uh, from Table Mountain, I think of, I've only seen images, I've not been, of this mountain sort of above and behind the city. I didn't realize that was the water source. I do know that you in Cape Town had a terrible water shortage a while back. Is that still going on? Will that be a permanent thing? Uh, we, we've we uh, seen the back of it. Uh, we go through, I suppose, the El Nino effect, which many uh, areas on, around the world go through. Uh, and that happens in cycles of about seven years. So every seven years for about a year or two, uh, we'll have a, a drought where we have uh, lesser rain than what is the average. Uh, what happened when we were counting down to day zero, uh, we happened to, because of climate change, uh, having four years of this, where for four years we were uh, counting less and less and less uh, sort of millimeters of rainfall that was falling. And the city had no choice but to, uh, I suppose, get 4.4 million people to change their behavior. And what's the one way to do it? you start counting down to a day when they won't get water coming out of the taps. We we more than halved the consumption of water in a massive city like this. Mm-hmm. There were other measures where you play with your tariffs, where you consume more than a certain amount, you're going to pay more money to the city uh, of Cape Town. Um, there were uh, technologies, uh, boreholes being used, um, desalination plants being brought in and so forth. Uh, because a major city like uh, Cape Town should not be running out of water. It, it definitely isn't. But despite the fact that we're next to the ocean and a lot of South Africa has a shoreline, we, we're very much a very uh, drought-stricken uh, country. Uh, so, so we need to come up with great technologies where we capture the maximum possible of water that is falling from the skies. And in the next 10 years, I imagine, we'll see technologies that is starting to look for sources of water elsewhere. Um, we're good now. Uh, our dam levels are sitting at about 98% because it's a winter raining uh, city, uh, but we won't see rain again until tail end of March, beginning of April next year. Mm-hmm. So we need to be careful. Good. I'm glad that you're at 98 percent. I had not had that update. I was I've been concerned about that. Um, So opera in Cape Town, we're going to say South Africa. Uh, I think you know that I've worked for one opera company in South Africa, the state opera company in Pretoria. I say that in inverted commas and quotation marks because I've never been. But they hired me to do work from New York City, which I did for them. And that was a pleasure. I also um, have been involved in in coaching South African singers in New York on repertory, on even the formation of the vowels, because Mm. I asked you, your pronunciation of your name is Melana, and I said, it's like Italian with the uh, pronunciation of all the vowels. But... um, I know from interviewing the famous bass baritone Musa, whose last name I cannot pronounce, a uh, marvelous person and marvelous singer, that there are many languages in South Africa. And therefore... So, yeah. There are officially uh, 11, 11 uh, yeah. official languages in South uh, Africa. Um, and they, 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 it is quite a bit. I mean, nothing compared to Nigeria. Nigeria has probably hundreds, I'm not sure. Um, but, but there are 11. Uh, English uh, seems to be the, 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 the language of business, uh, of commerce. 
uh, Afrikaans, which was a language of the previous dispensation, which we call the apartheid. So it's very developed. Uh, it's got universities where you can do full degrees and postgraduate degrees in Afrikaans. And then nine, uh, what we call vernacular languages. And they are generally divided into two groups. They are the Sutu group of languages, and they make up a, about four of them. And then the Nguni languages, which generally are along the coast. So. Uh, Zulu, uh, you know of King Shaka, um, Jacob Zuma, our former president, he comes from KwaZulu Natal, very proud um, sort of um, subgrouping of, of South Africa. I'm Kosa myself, so we went further down what's called the Blood River in the Eastern Cape, uh, and we um, interacted with the Khoisan, who were indigenous to this part uh, of South Africa, and they brought uh, the cliques that come in with just the lyricism of the language. There's something magical about, about consuming its cost. I mean, uh, Black Panther, of course, was a phenomenon, right, that took the world by storm, mm -hmm. and Dr. John Ghani played uh, one of the the leading characters and he introduced uh, or suggested to the Marvel uh, producers that the language that they create for Wakanda is Kosa. So imagine being in Cape Town, watching Wakanda and hearing is Kosa, like cinemas would just erupt into, <laughs> into great joy. Um, and then you get the smaller ones, the sort of Venda, um, uh, Spedi and so forth that, that make up parts of Central Africa. Uh, I could be in the middle of Limbopo, which is one of the Northern provinces and not understand a single word of what is communicated around me. And yet there will be fellow South Africans. Um, I want listeners to know that John Connie, you called him Dr. John Connie, is one of two actors. I believe the other is Winston Ntosha. And, and please correct my pronunciation. Uh, Winston um, Jonah is, uh, is Jonah. the pronunciation of his name. Yeah. Um, are, have toured the world in the plays of Athel Fugard and other playwrights, but really brought South African theater, spoken theater as opposed to opera, to international audiences. And during the apartheid era and when Nelson Mandela was imprisoned, they were often in New York. London sometimes, but very especially New York, and performed the plays of Athel Fugard, but then did all kinds of other theaters, Greek and Shakespeare and so on, and were very much a presence in our city. And they were a large part of my fascination for the life in South Africa, because we saw it depicted in these wonderful plays as being a combination of, yes, real tragedy and suffering, but also wonderful human spirit and humor in the face of adversity. And there, there, yeah. there was something there was something quite comical in many ways about the apartheid system, how a small grouping of people, uh, purely on the basis of how much melanin they have on their skin, were able to control the majority of South Africans. And some of the regulations and laws that they introduced were just silly. Um, one of the subgroupings uh, in South Africa are called colored people. Uh, in America, someone who's colored is generally somebody who's black. There's a particular distinction, what would be mixed race, but multiple generations, obviously, of that mixed race. There were 17 categories of colored people in the legislation of South Africa. Like, how, how silly is that? And, and because of the apartheid regime, uh, the state-funded and state-owned uh, broadcaster would sanitize the story that they would share. Uh, very much censored. Uh, you could not report beyond what was approved by the union buildings, which is where the capital city um, and the president's office sits. Uh, and so theater was the best way of documenting life. So what you saw on Broadway, for example, in Susa Banzi's Dead or The Island um, was true life as it was being lived in South Africa. And the theater was still allowed to be that wonderful sanctuary, if you like, where incredible theater makers and actors could tell the real story. And often um, South African, white South Africans who were obviously benefiting from apartheid would see and hear for the first time the true story of what was happening in South Africa. And yet they would live less than a kilometer away from that reality. Um, so we are absolutely delightfully grateful for the courage because it did take courage. They would often get into trouble. Um, many of our singers, uh, Huma Segela, Leta Mbule, Miriam Makeba, having to be exiled because they dared 
to sing the truth and to, I suppose, hold the leadership of the day to account. And it didn't like what they were saying and singing. And, 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 and the international community needed to see and know what is happening in South Africa. Um, he's still, of course, very active, Dr. John Ghani, uh, very, very much a man in demand for his work and for his, uh, particularly now on the big screen, but he writes fantastically still and gets to show his work all over the world. It's no secret that we here in America had our own apartheid. I, I, putting in the past tense with fingers crossed, we still have terrible, overt, awful racism that exists in daily life, but also entrenched racism that was baked into our system of laws and life and urban planning so that Black people and poorer people and what is now in America called people of color, as opposed to colored people, which is no longer an acceptable term here, um, were marginalized to districts near uh, toxic waste dumps, areas where uh, childhood illness would increase, where education was not as good. And that structural racism is something that we still face in our daily lives here and requires improvement, more than improvement, requires remediation. And it's a very hard struggle, and it's something that still goes on. I live in New York City, which is a bit different from much of the country in that we've always had people from everywhere. It's a primarily immigrant city. 40% of our population were born in other countries. Um, black and white people mixed a lot more here. Not perfect at all, but there was a lot more interaction, and I, growing up here, always had mixed race classes and, and to me my world were everybody and but i know that there are many parts of the nation and parts of new york state where people are just separate not necessarily by law but by circumstance and it is the arts often that create a dialogue and through the vehicle of music break barriers that that move people closer together. I was completely sensitized to the issues of South Africa, first through Miriam Makeva and Hugh Masekela and other musicians from South Africa, because what they did was wonderful. And I, I was susceptible in a good way to music. So um, it was very important. And because in New York, people mix a lot. You get to meet these actors, you meet these musicians, and uh, that's the wonderful thing here that somehow, while not perfect, my father was a musician in the 1940s, played with black musicians. And that was normal in these, in the fifties, when I was born, these musicians came to our home. So, but I, I see that as the exception, unfortunately, not the rule. And it's something that we have to be, yeah. It's very similar, uh, uh, Fred, because uh, we only 27 years into democracy. Some people uh, believe that that's enough for us to have addressed many of uh, the past injustices. Uh, I'm one of those people who doesn't think it is. It's going to take a few generations uh, before we get it right. Uh, it might not be race now that determines um, what experience you're going to have, which part of the Atlantic seaboard and the mountain you're going to be facing. It's now class and money. Can you afford? Can you not afford? Um, that seems to be the new differentiator. But uh, 1990, the year that Nelson Mandela was released from prison and political parties were unbanned, um, the Minister of Education at the time was spending the equivalent of, I would say, $5 perhaps on a Black child for the education in a year. Um, compare that to a white child, Caucasian child, who was maybe $300. $350 in a year, um, as far as spent on education is concerned. Fast forward now to, I'm um, 44, I would have been in grade um, grade eight uh, in 1990. Um, my peers who had a very different experience to me are going to be far advanced in where they are economically um, prospect wise, simply because of a decision that was made by somebody in 1990. And, and my life and my lived experience now is still very much impacted upon 
justify that decision. Uh, spatial planning is one of the obvious ways of moving people in particular regions or parts of the city. And Cape Town, as beautiful as it is, uh, still has a lot of that. Uh, rich, generally white people are much closer to the centers of business and to the ocean and to the mountain. Um, outside of that, colored people, um, outside of that, black people. So they are the furthest and often have the most um, unskilled sort of labor practices, right? And so they spend up to 80% of whatever wages they make on transport because they need to take two trains, a taxi, a bus, in order for them to get to work, work for 10 hours, leaving their houses in the dark, by the way. The children are still sleeping. They don't know whether the child is gonna wake up and make it to school on time. Did they do their homework? They come back at this time, nine o'clock uh, in the evening, the children have gone to sleep already. So the absence of parenting because the parent has gone to go look for what is a, a, an attempt at a living wage and it's nowhere near there. So, so that is the lived experience and reality of many, many Captonians and in, uh, South Africans. Joburg is slightly different. It is the economic hub of South Africa and some would argue uh, the African continent. Like New York, it's a city of immigrants. Everybody moved in because they're looking for uh, prospects. Um, and, and particularly the black voice is a lot more uh, louder in Johannesburg. They, they've gone into spaces and owned them. They own the properties. They, they occupy the dining tables at restaurants. They go to the uh, clubs and the entertainment places that they want. They're driving the big flashy cars because they, they, are, they are part of the middle class, the growing um, sort of middle class in South Africa. Uh, but Cape Town still has a lot of work to do. And then you go to Durban, which is a, another big city on, on the coast of Kosovo Natal. Uh, you, you know, that's where you find um, the second largest Indian community outside of India. And that plays itself in a dynamic that I don't even understand because in Cape Town, it's not a factor at all. Uh, it's a wonderfully complex country, this. Yeah. Fascinating, exciting, Durban, filled Durban with human spirits, but really worried. Yeah. Am I correct? Durban is where Gandhi lived and formed Correct. his yeah. notion of Satyagraha in South Africa, not in India. People don't know that. Correct. So I have a question I've never asked a South African, and if you know the answer, fine, and if you don't, fine. I'm so impressed with your constitution. I think it's a wonderful document, and so forward thinking, yes, America has basically a great con constitution with a few flaws in it, but it's a wonderful document. Other nations have written constitutions more recently than ours. Um, but South Africa's constitution is very recent and had a lot of foresight. Who was, was it Mandela? Was it Desmond Tutu? Who formed the moral and political frame of that constitution that, while not perfect, is a remarkable document for what your society had and still has and must face? Um, obviously, the former president Nelson Mandela would have been a, a driving force behind it. Uh, there was something uniquely special about the spirit of that man. Um, uh, he was statesmanly, without a doubt, even before he was released in, uh, in, from prison. Uh, his objective was simple. Let's create a South Africa where all South Africans are equal. It is very much regarded as a, a constitution for minorities where if you are a woman, if you are disabled, if you uh, are gay, uh, lesbian, um, you are protected. And it's very, very clear that it will protect your rights and your interests. Um, incidentally, the current president, Sol Ramaphosa, um, who in a battle for the deputy presidency to Nelson Mandela within the governing organization, African National Congress, had lost to Thabo Mbeki, who became uh, Mandela's successor, uh, he was tasked along with Ruth Mayer, who represented the Nationalist Party, which was the last um, uh, sort of apartheid regime party uh, in South Africa. The two of them led a committee of people who drafted that constitution. Um, it was made up primarily of legal minds from both sides. Uh, there were uh, elements of it that come from the Freedom Charter, which forms the political 
basis of the African National Congress, uh, obviously made contemporary and updated because uh, if you're drafting a document in the 1950s, you have a very different outlook to when you're drafting a document in 1996, which is when we uh, adopted it. Um, we also look to other parts of the world and see what, what, what elements we need to bring into our constitution that will obviously best serve the people of South Africa. It is wonderfully aspirational. Once again, it will take years for every single South African to enjoy the full promise of the constitution. But it's, it's an aspiration we strive for every day in this country. Just the fact that women, gays, lesbians, people with disabilities do not exist in the United States Constitution written in 1776. Those acknowledgments had to be won. And for gays and lesbians, very, very, very recently, the disabled in 1990, women, it's still happening. And there, there are still many things that have to be made equal for women that have not happened. In America, there was something called the Equal Rights Amendment that was adopted or proposed in the 1970s. Two thirds of the states have to approve of it. We could not get the Equal Rights Amendment for women passed. Wow. It's still not passed. So we, you know, America, I love my country. We are a fascinating, contradictory, energetic, creative, often very generous country. But we have blind spots. And one of them is the fact that it should be second nature that women are accorded every equal right to men. And, you know, and then if we want to go to further designations such as sexual orientation, uh, being other abled, whatever term you want to use. Yes, absolutely. You know, the original words are all men are created equal. The Mm. idea being that men are all people, but enough men in the 1900, in the 19th century said, well, it's just men. So women did not get the right to vote until the early 20th century. Black people officially had the right to vote somewhere in the 1870s but were denied it until 1965. And even now there are obstacles that are thrown up all the time as we speak to uh, in Galveston, Texas, they're redistricting, even though there are 45% black people in, in, in Galveston so that there are no black representatives in the city council. And that was yesterday. So, and today being November 19th, 2021 for people watching the future. Um, So I bring all this up because not to talk politics, because I love talking politics, but we're here for music and art. But I believe that it's important to understand the context in which Cape Town Opera was born in 1999, three years after your constitution. And the social history of Cape Town before and by extension South Africa, by bigger extension Africa itself. But um, I know that there has been, let's call it an operatic musical tradition in Cape Town since the 1920s, when uh, his name was Giuseppe Paganelli, I think was the name. I know nothing about Giuseppe Paganelli, except I'm guessing he was Italian. I know he was a tenor. How did he get to South Africa? And he founded the South African College of Music. Tell me more, please. <laughs> I wish I could, Fred. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I know, I, I certainly know the name. Yeah. Um, uh, stories have certainly been written about him. Um, but as to the detail of which ship he got on and why he decided oh. Cape Town, South Africa was going to be his destination, um, that, that bit of information, I'm afraid, I, I do not have. Uh, we, we, we have in this country a, a culture of music. We sing when we're happy. We sing when a new baby is born. We sing when there's death, when there's a wedding. Uh, we sing to mark milestones. We, we, have, we have music as part of our, of our soundtrack, don't we? And I mean, it's true for many communities and societies around the world. Um, uh, Cape Town Opera, by the way, being founded in 1999, um, existed in a different guise before. So the apartheid government um, decided that it wants to portray a, shall we call it, a facade of 
being civilized people. So they they created the state funded uh, units in the major cities. Cape Town had one, Johannesburg had, Pretoria particularly had one, Durban, Bloemfontein, and so forth. So all the major cities had these um, incredible units that were heavily state funded to mount um, dramatic works, um, to showcase ballet, dancing, uh, orchestras, and of course, opera. And in 1994, when the African National Congress took over, uh, the initial work was around the constitution. We adopted that in 1996. And then it was a case of what do we do with the money that initially would have been planned for a minority of the group, right? 10% of the population at the time within scraps being used for the remaining 90%. Now that same pool of, of tax funding and some grant and, and, and support funding uh, had to now service the entire population. And unfortunately, uh, the arts were not necessarily seen as a priority, despite the incredible work of artists like John Ghani, Hugh Masagela, Miriam Makeba, Letambule, and the list goes on and on and on in, in contributing towards the liberation that we enjoy today. Uh, the government of the day decided let's focus on other areas, social housing, uh, welfare system, uh, education, um, security, you know, all those things that governments decide is important. And so there was the disbandment of, of it was called KPAB in, um, in Cape Town, PACT in Pretoria and so forth and so forth. Um, and luckily enough, we had incredibly passionate individuals who decided, well, we're not gonna say goodbye to this history of incredible operatic music across all races, by the way. Um, the the, the KPAB funding was primarily directed towards white productions uh, directed and starring white people uh, with a sprinkling of um, of people of color. Uh, Professor Virginia Davids, uh, who's just retired from teaching from the School of Music uh, in uh, at UCT, uh, tells a story of, she was an amazing soprano, uh, you know, singing on stage. And there was a moment in this particular performance she was performing in where there's supposed to be some level of intimacy. And the tenor, who was a Caucasian male, refused to kiss her because the idea of doing that in the height of apartheid was just unthinkable. Uh, here with these amazing voices who we had a lot of work to do in teaching future generations, uh, we needed to give them a home. And so Captain Opera was founded in 1999 and continued uh, through generous benefactors, patrons, uh, funders, foundations, trusts, a little bit of government money, and I say a little bit of government money, um, went on to produce 22 years of incredible productions that we enjoyed here in Cape Town. And we've been lucky enough to have a tour to other parts of the world for many, many, many years. Um, it, it is really through sheer resilience, passion, love of the art form uh, that, that we have a Cape Town Opera. And sadly, it's the only performing arts company that is mounting operas, certainly in South Africa, and I would even argue probably on the African continent, um, which gives us a great, wonderful responsibility because there is a wonderful kid in the province of Limpopo, one of the poorest provinces in South Africa, a Cecilia, who um, is exposed to the work that is done by the Captain Opera Youth um, Development Education Team that goes out to all nine provinces when possible to teach the repertoire for um, uh, Saskia, which is a, a national singing competition. We always take our young artist performers and some of the chorus members with them. And then for the first time, this young Cecilia sees the possibility that with voice, you can actually, one, give expression in the way these incredible singers are doing, and two, possibly make a career out of it. She auditions for UCT, gets accepted, gets exposed to some of the best teachers, comes to start the process of being a young artist uh, uh, program member at Cape Town Opera, gets spotted by the English National Opera, um, transported to the UK, goes on to win the BBC Cardiff competition uh, last year, and now is a singer in one of, I think, most reputable companies in Europe. That would not have happened if Cape Town Opera was not here. Uh, so, so we very much appreciate the responsibility that we as a company have in keeping the art form alive. Uh, we always have to 
you know, make an argument that this is not an antiquated art form. It's not a Eurocentric art form. Without a doubt, the best practice of opera is very much in Europe and very much in parts of the United States. I, I don't question that. Um, we need to be commissioning and creating many new works coming out of Africa and telling the story of Africa and telling it with an African sound. Um, and I hope in the coming you know, years and decades, we'll get to see a lot more of those. Uh, but we need to exist because ultimately what what is opera? It's, it's art, yes. It's singing, yes. But it's telling human stories and finding a, a medium of telling a story that resonates with everybody. We, this week, we have La Rondine, Puccini's La Rondine, uh, performing at the Opera House uh, at, at the Artscape. Um, and I, I'd never been exposed to the opera before. I, I, I found out about it the first time when we announced it as part of the program at the beginning of this year. And to see these homegrown, marvelous singers singing in a language that they were not born into, but they've become familiar with because of the teaching and the work that they do, really putting on a show that is just marvelous and entertaining and bringing to life whatever Puccini imagined in writing this uh, most interesting of operators. So I believe that you have La Boheme coming up next. Is that correct? That is next week, literally. So... Let me so let me share something with you that I teach when I teach Puccini that perhaps you and your audiences don't know. This is my theory, but I think I'm correct. Um, two of the surviving characters in La Boheme are Rodolfo, who was with Mimi, and Musetta, who has probably broken up from Marcello. La Rondine is set maybe 20, 25 years later. And I believe that Rodolfo has become Ruggiero. <laughs> and I believe that Musetta has become Magda. And if you look at the germs of the characters that existed in Boheme and how those two kind of meet up, but then it doesn't work out uh, because Musetta is the way she is or Magda is the way she is, there is a direct link. And it's a rare circumstance that a company would be presenting both Rondine and Bohem so close together. But if you, if you care to share this with board members, audiences, and so on, to think of those two characters as the older versions of Rodolfo and Musetta, I think it will deepen that experience. I don't know. Wonderful, wonderful insight. Um, I saw uh, La Rondine on Tuesday and I'll be seeing for him next week, Tuesday. Um, I almost wish now that we had seen it the other way around. Yes. We had not to do the poem <laughs> if it went uh, to, to, to Rondine. Uh, we have a wonderful uh, benefactor, Judith Nielsen, who's based in Australia, uh, who uh, has given us a three year um, cycle of funding. And part of that funding is to create words that will cast South African voices uh, who are in South Africa. Um, as I said, we are the only uh, performing arts company with the expression of opera. So therefore we cannot absorb every single voice that is talented. So there are those young artists performers who were part of our company, uh, who unfortunately never made it to Europe or to the United States um, and needed to give way for other young performers. And so they go back home, often teaching music at high school or wherever they find opportunity to express their artwork, but they still have these amazing voices. And so conditional to that grant was that we create words that are gonna be compact enough to be able to move uh, to smaller cities. So Kabecha in the Eastern Cape, East London, uh, Hrafrenet, Otsuren. Uh, these are all sort of in the Southern Cape part of, um, of South Africa. Really a pack up and go, uh, but beautiful in expression and sound still so that we can expose other audiences outside of Cape Town uh, to, to opera. Um, we, we did that, wonderful success. And of course in Cape Town, we said, but we'd love to see it. <laughs> and we had, we had space on the opera house and we decided we're gonna do a treat and um, have a double Puccini bill. Uh, so when I see it on Tuesday, Fred, I will certainly be thinking of your insights and, and sharing, sharing it with the company members. When we were talking earlier about South African actors and theater that came to New York, one of the presenters was a, an organization called the Manhattan Theater Club, which advocates for new theater and international works. Another one that is I'm deeply in love with is a place called the Public Theater. 
that mm. was invented, created by a man named Joseph Papp about 60 years ago. And his idea was to bring Shakespeare to places in New York City where it was never seen and to present it for free. And he got funding. And then there was a beautiful old dilapidated library building in lower Manhattan that was bought by the public theater for one dollar and it was converted into theater spaces and actor studios and so on. And then they got a, a truck of vehicle that was able to transport productions that would open up from the truck and you could drive it wherever you wanted. And within that truck was a stage and they would mount it. It's kind of like the story of Pagliacci of traveling around Southern Italy mm -hmm. to places that had no theater or entertainment and doing that. Now the public theater has presented, created Hare, a chorus line, Hamilton, many works that we are, you know, we all know all over the world, but it continues to bring theater to audiences. It does free Shakespeare in the park in Central Park in the summer. And they have Shakespeare in the boroughs with these trucks to go around. Now they use flatbed trucks instead of opening up trucks. And I, you know, I think it's a wonderful way, not just for theater, but for opera to be brought. During the pandemic, when audiences could not gather, the New York Philharmonic got a flatbed truck and some of its musicians sat on it with two singers, Stephanie Blythe and Anthony Roth Costanzo, and they traveled around New York City and would stop at a corner and perform for the people in the neighborhood who had never seen it. Um, it's outreach that's manageable, so to speak. Um, I, 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 I totally agree with that. Uh, in a South African context, uh, once again, pre-1994, the apartheid government did build small, but effective and well-designed uh, mini opera houses, civic theater centers that have the acoustics that are to die for, uh, the lighting rigs that will be able to stage um, a, a, a fantastic production. They're not the size of Cape Town um, at the Artscape or the state uh, theater that you worked with in Pretoria, uh, but they're able to take a compact uh, sized uh, sort of opera production. So uh, those are the stages that we took advantage of. In Otsuren, there was one of the um, primarily Afrikaans theater festivals, um, and they they asked us for, 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 for a few performances of our opera, which once again, wherever we went, we sold out because unfortunately, because of the pandemic, the number of people allowed in a venue uh, were very, very much uh, minimized. But that's that's our objective. We There is the grandness, isn't there, of uh, ball gowns and black ties and walking up this grand staircase into the chandelier foyer of uh, uh, the artscape and then going into this auditorium and 1,500 of you uh, are waiting in anticipation as the conductor comes out of the orchestra pit and, you know, starts the overture and then the curtains open and wow, magic. And, and there will always be space for that. And we need to cultivate that and we need to promote it and we need to make it happen for as long as possible. B but we also need to, to go to Limpopo and, and stand perhaps on a flatbed truck under a tree and invite these masses of South Africans to come and delight in, in the wonder of music. I mean, uh, we, we, we've got a, a lovely uh, Baroque uh, orchestra uh, the Cape Town Baroque Orchestra in, in, in Cape Town that has instruments that were, that were played hundreds of years ago. And you listen to that music and you go, somebody 400 years ago wrote this music. And in 2021, I'm still able to delight in it. In fact, they had a wonderful program recently of Latin music. Um, so you'd hear a bit of a salsa sound to a piece of, 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 of musical instrument that was played 200 years ago. Magic. It's lovely. It's, it's, a, it's a pure privilege to be in Cape Town. I can imagine. I can't wait. Um, I wonder if many of those Baroque instruments were brought by, I'll say the people, the Dutch people who arrived for use a polite term, which is really not the accurate term, in South Africa, the southern part of the African continent, because Amsterdam has a very long, very deep Baroque tradition that it maintains to this day. And many of the much of the scholarship about Baroque music, even if it was written in Germany or Italy, 
is done in Amsterdam rather than in Germany or Italy. Yes, there's that scholarship too, but Amsterdam is a real center for Baroque music. Do you think maybe some of those instruments arrived with the Dutch? I, 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 I certainly the instruments that are being played now, uh, I imagine the, um, uh, the company had to to go and source to to go and purchase i'm not sure if they found any instruments that would have been brought in in the 1600s uh that they were able to uh find useful or, or play with um uh, but but it, it's a question that the, the the company would have to would have to to yeah. respond uh we we've done we've done um pergolesi's david mata with them uh for uh for television production and we partnered with cape town city ballet another another fantastic company that is working working very hard every day to make sure that they mount productions. And it's quite interesting because what a lot of companies were doing was mounting a stage production and then rigging up cameras and filming what was on stage in the hopes that Fred and Africa would sit in front of their computers on the couch and enjoy it. And I don't know about you, Fred, it wasn't always as satisfying because, you know, the, the the delight of being in an auditorium and and hearing the music that that's that's the contract isn't it that's that's the compact uh, that we're supposed to to participate in but what Matthew Wilde our previous artistic director did was then go to David Turner who's the um head of the ballet uh, and went to the um, uh, baroque uh, orchestra and said let's create something but with a visual mind as in television in mind a new set of skills were being learned by all three companies. How, how, do you, how do you get one of South Africa's most celebrated choreographers who was in London at the time, had won a, an Olivier for his choreography to choreograph a piece via Zoom to dancers who are in Cape Town and have it translate in the manner that it did. Um, an exception piece of work uh, I mean the music is amazing and so we had these these, these two soloists who are obviously performing the music uh, we had the Baroque festival uh, the Baroque orchestra and then you had these dancers who were moving uh, within clearly defined squares because we needed to keep them socially distanced because of COVID-19 it's been terrifying the pandemic it really really has it's been devastating uh, particularly for the performing arts I know far too many people who are not only uh, opera singers but uh, theater makers who, who have not earned a single cent over nearly two years, but where opportunities to create and create differently have been exercised. What has come out has been exceptional. I understand. I, you know, I used to be out in the world working in opera companies and so on. And I created this program, Fred Plotkin on Fridays when I had to be in. And I've been doing this thanks to Idacho since April 24th of 2020 and happily do it. I want to circle back to something that we touched on, but I want to go deeper with it. That since the 1920s, University of Cape Town has had the South African College of Music and therefore for a century, there has been the presence of musical training, including vocal training Correct. there that is considered of a very high level. I am friendly with the gentleman, I assume you know, named Kamal Khan who yeah. is a wonderful teacher and coach who uh, works at the Met. I believe he's in Hong Kong at the moment, but I know that he's devoted a great part of his life to education in South Africa, specifically at the university. And he's not the only one. And therefore this tradition, this ability, the scores, just even the fact that the scores and the instruments are there, has meant that there is this legacy that's now a century on and that many of the finest singers produced in South Africa go through that school. And many, I mean, someone that I've worked with a little bit is Pretty Yende. And mm -hmm. Pretty Yende is maybe one of the most famous South African singers, the soprano. What's particular about her is that she has everything that one would want. She's a great actor, beautiful, sing, extraordinary singer, a uh, great facility with languages and has the foundation that she got in South Africa. But then she studied at the Academia de la Scala in Milan. And I worked at La Scala when I was a young man. I trained there and I can always spot a La Scala trained singer. And this is a compliment 
because of a particular combination of factors of stage awareness of what the Italians call, um, I'm suddenly forgetting the word in Italian. Uh, it's a word that kind of means that you act in the moment and I'll think mm. of it, but the ability to respond on the stage to estro, E-S-T-R-O, to situations that present themselves and bring your best. Um, that's a very particular Italian thing on the stage. Whereas the French I studied in France too have very formalized gesture and, and what the French do is wonderful, but it's a different thing and different again from the English and the Germans and the Austrians. Each country has its own traditions on the stage. And Pretty Andy brings all of her natural gifts, all of her South African foundation, plus that. So for example, when we did in New York, La Fille du Régiment by Donizetti at the Met in Italian, but it's, I mean, in French, but it's an Italian opera composer and it's a comedy, but it's a comedie l'armeon, a tearful comedy. Um, at a certain point, her character Marie has to explode with anger. And she went into Sosa, you, you pronounce X-H-O-S-A. And it was just stunning to the audience. And it was that kind of estro that I think she decided that if she's going to go deep into the anger of the character, it cannot be in French or Italian. It has to be in the language. Yeah. And it just brought down the house. It was stunning. Also, it brought down her performers because they looked at her and what is she saying? But she did it <laughs> musically, estro, in the moment. And so, I mean, she's an, a stunning example, but hardly the only example of a whole generation of great singers, mostly Black, from South Africa that are now on the world stages. Would you talk about knowing that these people are all among you and have come from you? You said that so many of them then go back to their cities and townships and so on, but a fair amount have moved to Europe and are making yeah. careers if you live here in the United States. We, we, we uh, the South African voice, uh, thankfully, is not just the flavor of the month. It's, it's been the flavor of the month for quite a while. I imagine if you were to do an audit of some of the major opera stages and houses ac across the world, you'll probably find a South African singer, um, either as, as a principal singer or as certainly part of the uh, chorus or the Young Artist Program. Uh, Pretty End, of course, is probably one of our best exports. Uh, Pumeza Machikiza has just come back uh, from Germany, where she had a, an illustrious career. And I imagine post-pandemic, he's certainly planning to go back. Uh, Livy uh, Sekhapane, probably one of the best Balkanto tenors in the making, uh, coming very much from the very same school that you were talking about. In fact, he's on your West Coast at the moment performing. Yes, I've heard um, him, yeah. <laughs> in an opera there. Uh, Sunny Boy Lada has uh, torn Excellent. stages in, yeah. in, in, in Europe. Um, uh, Golda Schultz, I mean, like, hello. <laughs> you know, uh, and the names can just roll out uh, of our mouths. Um, and it is very much to do with the teaching. Our, our partnership and collaboration with, uh, with the School of Music at uh, the University of Cape Town um, is essential. Uh, Jeremy Silva uh, is now heading it up. Uh, a man who enjoys an incredible and illustrious career uh, in the art form. Um, I, uh, they were directing uh, Cozy uh, last year at the Baxter Theatre, which is a theatre centre that's based on the base of, of, of the university. And, and I snuck in during one of the rehearsals. And to watch him, uh, one, conducting the, 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 the orchestra, but at the same time going to the students and saying, why don't you try that? Have you, have, have you thought of it this way? Uh, tell me, what are you feeling right now? And, and just watching him, it's, it's a skill. It's, 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 it's magical um, what happens in, in that rehearsal room. But, you know, when they, they start getting it ready for the stage, it, it's incredible. And if we didn't have the best teachers that are available to us, uh, teaching these young singers, they would not be ready to conquer the stages around the world as as they are right now. Um, I think of Martin Kieze, who's in Amsterdam, an incredible baritone, uh, who was part of our Young Artist Program. Um, the work he's doing is just, is just outstanding. And, and every one of them will detail the teaching 
that they were exposed to. Uh, without UCT and the School of Music, I, I guarantee you there would be no Captain Opera. We, we would not be able uh, to, to find a source of these incredibly well-trained voices um, to, to form part of, of the company. Uh, there are other schools uh, across the country. Um, in Northwest, uh, the University of Northwest has uh, an incredible, in fact, a board member, Professor Conrad Cupiter, uh, who's, who's heading up uh, the school there. Um, in the Eastern Cape, uh, University of Fort Hare, former president Nelson Mandela's uh, university, uh, there's a burgeoning school there that, that is teaching incredible, incredible music. Um, and of course, depending on resources and access to vocal coaches and teaching, um, a simple thing like inviting uh, someone like you, Fred, for example, to come and 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 be here and be in residency for two or three months, and then we we would share the resource with the university where you're able to get on campus and actually give master classes and teach properly while you're working with our singers, mm-hmm. and, you know, either on a production that is upcoming or on a repertoire that we want to strengthen our ability on, um, and that's something that's possible to do because. Uh, yes, we we are funded by by patrons and 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 benefactors and, and the state to some to some point. UCT has its own sources of funding, and if you and if you share the love, uh, you know the, the the burden is is halved in some way, um, and that relationship is essential for us. Without it, uh, I, I promise you, we would not be existing twenty two years later as Cape Town Opera, and certainly. I imagine UCT would argue that they would probably not have a healthy sought after school a hundred years later if they did not have an opera company that they can feed into. You mentioned the opera Cosi Fantute, which is an extraordinary work and one that often is dismissed for any number of reasons. And the question I'm about to ask you is not based on the racial history of South Africa, but the social history of South Africa, I really want to make that distinction. Mm. Would you say that audiences, that performers themselves have any sense of social hesitation, concern, whatever word you want to use about portraying certain kinds of characters, not for racial issues, but because of their, let's call it moral, social behavior obviously a character like don giovanni is or carmen are complex characters but what's proposed in cosi fantute is really a certain kind of manipulation of Mm. social mores and when treated like a light sex comedy sort of forgets everything else that that opera is apart from the amazing music it's really some of mozart's most beautiful music but I always I love that opera, but it's always a challenge to teach it, to coach it, to direct it, because in the rehearsal room and with audiences and with some critics, it raises so many issues that people are uncomfortable with. And it's not just that opera. I mean, obviously, we can talk about any number of operas with social bad actors Um, is rather than my asking further. What is the environment like for engagement with social issues as presented on the operatic stage? Uh, Fred, I would imagine that because that was our collaboration with uh, the University of Cape Town. So the the the, the core of, of, of what was heard singing on stage was very much uh, out of UCT. I would imagine uh, that that the, the vocal coaches, the professors, uh, the director, would have spent a lot of time with the students to to unpack those themes, right, and and hopefully go really deep in terms of their meaning, um, uh, how portraying them on stage will impact not only the audience but generally the the, the, the general public. Uh, in South Africa, we're not we're not scared to tackle social issues head on. Uh, we, we've had no choice but to. Um, there's an objective to to get to a point of social cohesion as a country. I think there's an appreciation in order for us to get there, we actually have to, you know, sit around a fire and just talk and be brutally honest, uh, expose vulnerabilities, um, because that's the only way you're going to progress. That's the only way you're going to go to a point of, ah, that is the issue I have with it. 
Why do I have an issue with it? Why does that trigger, I suppose, a particular emotion and reaction? What work do I need to do to deal with that? And hopefully it's an invitation. And, and if it's facilitated in a wonderful way, and an opera can provide that because it, uh, there's at once an opportunity to escape, right? Uh, it's cosy fun today. It's um, depending on where you set it, you, you, you allow your mind to suspend disbelief and go into that setting, into that period. And, and then, as you say, listen to the beautiful music. Uh, but because it's somewhat outside of your reality, you're then able to go, okay, let me understand the issues here. How do they relate to my life? And if I were in that situation, how would I react? How would I respond? How should I react? How should I respond? And if, if you've gone to the opera with, with really great, incredible, insightful and interesting people, you'll go out to a wine bar and enjoy a glass of red wine and discuss and debate and, um, and be part of the discourse, right? Uh, that, that needs to happen. So, so I imagine it happens very much in, in the teaching environment because ultimately that's, that, that is their purpose. I know at Cape Town Opera, it's very much part of, of the conversation that happens even before the first note is sung in, in trying to understand what are the issues here? Why is Cape Town Opera mounting this production on this date in 2021? What are we wanting or expecting from the audience? How do we want to engage with them on these broad themes that are brought up by... Um, by this production, because yes, there is an element of entertainment, but there's, as I said earlier, a social responsibility that comes with the work. And, and the audience, hopefully, I know I do this, uh, I'm a broadcaster by profession, I certainly take those issues onto a platform like the radio station I work for and, and help and hope to be, you know, to grapple some of those issues. So, so we don't shy away from social issues. We, we tackle them head on, at least the circles I, I find myself in. Mm -hmm. About 20 years ago, I was invited to teach sort of a mini symposium at West Point, which is the U.S. Army Military Academy, historic, north of New York City. And many of the finest cadets who go on to serve our country well in the best sense of what the military often does and can do. Uh, are trained there. So these are often very bright, sensitive, caring, compassionate people who have chosen the military for their life. And as it happened, the two operas being done at that time at the Metropolitan Opera were Aida by Verdi and Così Fan Tutte by Mozart. And so I taught both. And I thought, okay, this is a military academy. Aida poses issues such as, do you put personal desires above responsibility to the country, those issues about national nationhood, about freedom and all of that, that that would be the opera that they would engage with. And I thought, well, Cosi Fantute will be sort of, you know, a light confection on the side. To my complete surprise, almost every cadet, male and female, understood got Aida, that was very clear, the lines of authority, the lines of putting nation above self, and so all of that was very clear. But Così Fan Tutte really threw them because mm. it presented the subtleties of human nature that was not part of their development and perhaps predisposition. And they were not the kind of people who would show emotion but were deeply moved by so many issues in that opera. One of them being that when the two young men, um, Guglielmo and Ferrando, pretend to go off to war and the chorus sings Viva il Militar, and then they're going to come back disguised and deceive their girlfriends, which is cruel anyway. Um, mm. And the audience laughed because it was meant to be comedic. My cadets from West Point did not laugh at all. They found it very yeah. upsetting that the audience was laughing when these young boys were going off to the military. And then when they came back, they didn't like that they were deceiving their girlfriends because that was not honest. And they didn't, they didn't, it's not that they didn't like, but they, it challenged every assumption 
that they had about human nature, about loyalty, about fidelity, about responsibility to the next person. And to me, it was mind opening the degree to which these rather formal, very educated people allowed themselves to feel with Cosi Fantute, whereas I thought it would be Aida. So I that, say that, this that, in part because that, that that's the magic of performing arts, though, isn't it? That that uh, if 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 you have not moved someone um, with 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 your direction, with your singing, with your dancing, whatever the case may be, um, have you failed? Other people say no because sometimes you just want to entertain and you know da 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 da. Um, I I prefer words, um, be it literature, be it big screen movies or television work, be it operas, be it theater, uh, that, that, that will leave me pondering questions about what it is to be human. Uh, why am I here right now? What am I here to do? How, how, how am I to um, uh, develop, become a better human being, be, become a, a better expression, I suppose, of what my parents desired uh, for me to be. Uh, and, I, and I'd much rather take a, an experience like that any day um, than uh, a forgettable franchise of a movie. So I agree with you completely. Um, so maybe for your company's 25th anniversary of Cape Town Opera in 2024, um, you can do Aida, which is a big opera and a kind of thing you do for big anniversaries, and Cosi Fantute, which has six characters and a small chorus. And you have a glorious, they won the International Opera Award for Best Opera Chorus in the World, your chorus. So it's a magnificent chorus that I've heard. Um, that might be an interesting contrast because based on what I just discussed with you and based also on talking about Puccini of La Ronde de Bohème, the way these operas talk to one another is something unexpected. Often. I, I'm sure. I'm sure Magdalene Minar, who's our newly appointed artistic director, um, who herself actually was a, a student of opera at, uh, at, uh, at UCT, uh, went on to be part of, it was called in a vocal ensemble, which was a version of a young artist program, went to the Met, in fact, to, uh, to do some wonderful work there, came back to South Africa, started a company called Bibliotech, um, which is Afrikaans for library, but the concept is more complex than that. Um, and she's, she, she interviewed successfully and she's got some wonderful ideas of, of where to go to with the company over the next uh, uh, four to five years. Uh, she's watching us right now, Fred. I'm sure she's made some notes and she will be, Hello, she will be considering that wonderful <laughs> generous Magdalena idea. Martin. Is her name Magdalena Martin? Magdalene. Uh, Magdalene. 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 Okay. Yeah. So you have a general director and an artistic director. Alex, Alexander Gabriel is Correct. general director. You were acting general director during the search for, Correct. yes. How did that feel? <laughs> um, wonderfully um, challenging, uh, a thrill because I've been a board member now for, for, for seven years. And, and perhaps let me preamble it by, by sharing a very short story. Uh, I, I grew up in Googlet, one of the townships um, in, in, in Cape Town. And every Sunday, my uncles would um, uh, sort of put on an LP of Miles Davis or Hugh Masegela while we were working on the car outside, as apparently people do every Sunday. Uh, I would listen to some fantastic soulful music of uh, um, even the Supremes, for example. And I love Diana Kroll from Canada. Her, her jazz vocals are, are outstanding. Uh, and opera was something that existed primarily through popular media. Uh, a snippet of it was uh, a, on a soundtrack to a particular scene in a movie or a series that I was watching and go, oh, wow, that's, that's interesting. Um, but I never really explored it until a dear friend of mine, Skumbuzo Mafane, uh, his grandmother and my grandmother were best friends and they'd been friends since really the late 40s. Mm -hmm. um, uh, her grandmother, Umagaba, as we called her, uh, was, was quite well off. Her husband had a number of businesses in the 60s, a uh, couple of butcheries, and, uh, you know, they lived in a, in, a, in a fairly decent house for uh, 
middle class black family in apartheid South Africa. Sadly, uh, her husband passed away uh, in the middle of the 60s and women, never mind black women, were not allowed to own assets. So she lost all of that uh, instantly. Uh, she then went to go build uh, a shack, a, a room basically made out of uh, zinc tin uh, in the back of uh, her, her sister's home in Guguletu where she lived for decades. And as the years go by, uh, elderly women think about how um, their funeral is going to be. And her dream was her coffin must come out of a brick house as opposed to a tin shack. Um, fast forward many years, Skumbuz and I are running around Google Air too and doing all sorts of things. And uh, because of, I suppose, circumstance and the dynamic that we find ourselves in, despite his good marks at the end of school, he never had opportunities to go to university. I was lucky. I was able to go study accounting, but he had this marvelous voice. He had the most, he sang like an angel and he went to go audition for uh, Captain Opera. Uh, he, he was accepted to be part of uh, the chorus and was there for, I think close on eight years, actually. Uh, he got exposed to some of the best stages uh, in the world. There was a year he spent almost three months in Spain um, and in the money that he was earning and the stipends he was enjoying, he would save that. And he came back one day and bought his grandmother um, a house. And she went on to enjoy the rest of her life in this brick house that brought her dignity, um, respect, and just joy. And it was Cape Town Opera that made that possible. That it was, whole story is an opera itself, you know. It is an opera all by itself. That opera and, can be written. It, it has a, a structure, a narrative. It has two protagonists. That's an opera with the construction of the brick house. You know, the tin goes away. The, I mean, there are so many works in opera where people are building or taking things down. Have someone write that opera. I'm serious. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's, how, that's how I got exposed, one, to the company and therefore to the music. So my, my appreciation of opera is very much a fraction of your appreciation of it, without a doubt. But, but I wanted to create opportunities for more skumbuzos who have the sheer God-given talent of just this amazing voice. I want them to be able to go to UCT if the opportunity allows, and then to come to a company like Cape Town Opera. And so my contribution could be to make sure that as a board member, um, the company continues to exist. And my word, we, we work very hard uh, with the executive team to make sure that um, the company exists in order for it to create the work uh, that it does. And so sitting on the board and having the honor of being vice chair to Susan Smith, um, gives you a distant view of the company. Uh, you, you read the management reports that come in quarterly, um, once in a while, at performances at opening nights, you, you know, get to talk to the company members. Uh, on the odd occasion, we'd be invited to a company meeting where perhaps a board has an update for, for the company. But, but to now be acting general manager and be there every day and witness the sweat and the blood that goes into making making what we do happen is is glorious. We 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 are small to medium sized opera company, right? For for every one role uh, occupied by individual uh, who is part of the management team or the um, administrative team, there are probably five people employed for those roles in 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 a company in Europe, right? Um, we have a fraction of the resources, um, so it's not like we're paying the person five times the salary, unfortunately. But these men and women come into the company every day, frustration and all, to make sure that ultimately. Puccini's La Rondine that is going to be shown on the opera stage is going to be exceptional. So to have firsthand uh, witness to that was a thrill and a joy. And it's certainly driven me as a board member even more to make sure that we make an even greater success of it. So, so that for me was a greatest lesson that that notion of wow i'm not just a board member who sits in meetings ever so often uh, th th there's a company that is made up of passionate people um we we uh, our thrill is the fact that we're able to employ our chorus members full time so they wake up in the morning and they come to the artscape where they will be working on their voice they're not bank tellers executive 
assistance to CEOs of companies who in the evening per chance, because they've got a good voice, will come and no, that's that's their full-time job. We we afford them a salary um, and certainly a decent living uh, through 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 performing and where possible, we expose them to to the world and my world. They they've traveled <laughs> and we, we can't wait to go back to touring again because um you only learn when you're playing with the best and being the only opera company performing arts company uh in uh in cape town and in south africa uh means that we need to export our product in order for us to to see how we're faring to see how we're doing and to expose the singers to some of the best in the world i don't know in south africa about is there any tradition or can there be a tradition of corporate sponsorship? Yes, you have funders who may be generous, passionate, private individuals of means, but um, in certainly in the United States and in some other countries, Italy now with La Scala, there is a degree of corporate sponsorship, either of individual productions. They don't want to underwrite paying for light bulbs and toilet paper, as I've mm. heard it said many times. They don't want their name on that, but those have to be paid for as well. But they do often underwrite a conductor's chair, a singer's scholarship, a choral leadership post, or um, part or all of a new production. I know that South Africa with its natural resources has companies that are very, very wealthy. There are certain few wineries that may be able to support that. You spoke before of sitting down with a glass of red wine. I'm going to talk to you in a minute about South African wine. Um, but is there corporate sponsorship? Can there be? No, definitely. Uh, so uh, Leslie Little and her team uh, head up that department of the company and, and their job is to uh, go out every day and, and look for, for opportunities. Um, we, we, many of the big, particularly financial services uh, corporates uh, have foundations that are attached uh, to it. And they're very clear uh, and defining what they will support. Uh, we, we, we had multiple year support from one of the biggest uh, private wealth uh, sort of banking institutions through their foundation. Um, and at every three to six years, they review then what, what their support is going to be. And we're waiting to find out what the next three to six years is going to be focusing on and see whether there'll be uh, opportunities there. Um, uh, we have in the past had um, other companies, and uh, as you say, saying, you know, that production, we wanna take out or pay for all of the performances. So they have a project that they'll be able to then you know, they have corporate social responsibility reports that they have to write up. And if you are able to say, this was our contribution uh, towards not only a piece of uh, wonderful performance, but you gave employment to so many singers, to so many seamstresses, carpenters, mm -hmm. uh, lighting uh, technical crew, directors, um, uh, you afforded the company the opportunity to be an ambassador for South Africa in name the country in the Far East or Europe or the United States, because that's what we become, right? When we travel, we, we become the South African representation uh, to certainly the audience that is that is in the auditorium and the people uh, we interact with. Uh, over the 22 years, um, we've contributed something like 350 million rand, uh, which would be ugh, mathematics, $35 million, perhaps, uh, to the economy of Cape Town. Uh, not, not just singers, as I said, but the man who's going to build a set and paint something and, uh, you know, make sure that the, the lighting rig comes in on time and so forth and so forth. Um, and, and that's a welfare we've had an impact on uh, families who have children to take to school and to feed them and to take care of their, of their health. And that ultimately is a story. And if, if you sell that to a CSI director of a corporation, uh, it's gold. Um, and, and, and we definitely, uh, we have opportunities there that, we can, that we, can, uh, we can explore. In New York, we tend to say that for every dollar of either government or corporate money that's spent on the arts, it earns out $6 in income for the city where, where the arts institution is. And that tends to be a very good measurement. 
So you were talking before about listening to Miles Davis as a younger man. You're still a young man. I wonder <laughs> if you listen to a singer who my father, the musician, adored, who was the South African singer, Diane Shure. Yes. Wonderful. Uh, what, she's, she's phenomenal, isn't she? She's blind. And her scatting is second only to Ellis Fitzgerald. And she has a powerful, dramatic voice. And she's not like Andrea Bocelli, who would pretend to be an opera singer and so on. I think that Diane Schuer, were she not blind, um, probably would be a rather remarkable dramatic soprano. I and agree. I would, I would love I to hear her. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a reason why Aretha Franklin became the superstar in the Franklin family and not her sister, who vocally actually was stronger, I believe, than Aretha. Carolyn uh, or the other one? She had two sisters. Oh, who is... Um, uh, I forget the other one's name, but... I'll think of it. I'll think of it in a moment. Mm -hmm. moment. Uh, th th there's an ability for Aretha to connect almost instantly with you as a person who's listening. You feel the pain. You feel the joy. You feel the apprehension. You feel the confusion. I thought you loved me, but what's going on here? And she does it in that wonderfully raspy way that she does. And, and, and there is a lot of sincerity and vulnerability. She's willing to put her heart everywhere over that recording. And, and for me, Diane was, was a similar singer where, where you felt every note, you felt every lyric, you felt every melody, you felt every harmony. And, and she, she was one of those artists where if you listen to her, uh, you would not walk away from, that, from, from hearing her music and not be moved. Uh, if, if, if you weren't moved, then you don't have a heart. Like there's just something missing where this muscle is supposed to be beating. Amazing singer. And I agree with you. She would have made a lovely dramatic soprano. Uh, you remind me of several stories. Well, I do want to tell listeners that Diane Shure is spelled S-H-U-U-R, and yes. she's worth discovering. Um, I'm what's called an aretheologist, and I can't oh, believe yeah. I don't remember the other sister's name, but it was Carolyn. I have loved Aretha since the very beginning and studied her life and her music, and she wrote a book, co-wrote a book, uh, called From These Roots, which I think is a fascinating book in the early chapters, because she talks about the music she heard, mm. not just her father as a preacher, but all the music that she heard, whether it was gospel or opera or classical or country and Western or Broadway. And every time she came to New York, I would go to hear Aretha perform. Mm. And among the many things about her that we sometimes forget is she was a remarkable pianist Correct. and the piano Correct. playing would be in juxtaposition but often commentary or riffs on what she was singing and she knew where she was going to go singing wise we didn't it was like mozart's music that we think we know where he's going but then where he goes we say well of course that's where we're supposed to go mm -hmm. she would do that with a voice but then the piano would say something entirely otherwise and if you're musically inclined like me, it wasn't just sitting back and hearing this famous singer. It was like listening to Bach or Mozart in terms of her ability in the hands and the voice and the head and the heart. It was all combined and always unpredictable. And she never sang the same song twice because she was not yeah. in the same mood at the same time. And so, yes, I yes. <laughs> I wish I had met her. That's all I can say. I never met Aretha Franklin. But Unfortunately, we never got to see her performing in South Africa because of her fear of flying. Yeah. So she never, she never traveled. Of course, she, she contributed to many yeah. a concert. Uh, oh, you know, America, of course, was instrumental in raising the plight of apartheid in South Africa and incarcerated Nelson Mandela, amongst others. Yes. Uh, when he was released, uh, he learned his name. Uh, in fact, his jail cell number, the 46664, uh, as a fundraising tool for the Nelson Mandela Foundation that does incredible work, particularly with children's education, not only in South Africa, but in sub-Saharan Africa. 
Shakespeare. And Aretha Franklin contributed to many of the concerts, um, particularly those uh, hosted in, in, in New York and other parts of America. Uh, phenomenal, phenomenal spirit. And then you reminded me of a story that I have not thought of in 45 years. I was a student at the University of Bologna, Italy's leading music institute, not as a music conservatory, but as a performing arts institution like Juilliard is in Bologna. It's called DAMS, Dipartimento di Arte, Musica e Spettacolo. And at that time we had what was called a discoteca, not a disco, but a library of discs. We didn't go dance there and they were LPs on turntables. And although I was doing all my classical and opera stuff, I missed hearing some Aretha, which was not on the radio. And they had an Aretha recording and I put it on the turntable and it started going around and I put on earphones and inevitably I started to move about. Along comes one of my classmates from Nigeria, a bass with an amazing voice, a wonderful man, young man at the time. And he put on the earphones and he sat there and he never moved. And I looked at him as I, I was just moving with the music and he sat and he listened and he listened and he listened and he took it off. He said, I don't understand that. And I said, why? And he said, well, because, well, it's not opera. It's not singing that way. And I said, well, it's a whole other kind of freedom in singing with an incredible amount of gifts. Let's listen to it again. And again, he sat very seriously. He was a very bright guy and he just analyzed everything. And I said, please, his name was Badinga. Please, Badinga, don't analyze, just feel it. Be a pleasure activist. Let it go through you. And he began to tap his foot. And that's all I got out of him with Aretha Franklin. But it, <laughs> <laughs> it's a way of saying that all of us, no matter our background, whatever, we respond differently to different kinds of music. And yeah. And if the music is good, if the music is constructed well, if the music, um, uh, was it Bill Withers with Grandma's Hands? Short, short number of, of, I don't know, two, two and a half minutes. And, 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 and it's, everybody can relate to that story. Absolutely, every, it's primarily about a grandmother in, I imagine the Southern States of America. West Virginia. Um, West Virginia. And, and there are references that are obviously uh, certainly unique to, to Bill Withers sort of uprising, uprising, but the, the, the uh, sort of rearing up. But, but we all can connect because we all have a grandmother who loves us dearly, who warns us of pitfalls that are coming. We sometimes don't listen. And then when the pitfalls do bite, you remember, oh, grandma did say this. And then you rush back to her for hopefully a glass of milk and a, and a digestive biscuit so that you can feel better. In um, her brick house. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> in, the, in the brick house. Um, so, so, so music is, I mean, it's a food for the soul, I suppose. That, that's, that's the generic term that people say, but it truly is true. Uh, and, and, and if you allow yourself, and sometimes it's a risk because if, you know, if, if, if it moves you too much and you're overwhelmed by it emotionally, uh, you might either need a therapist's chair or just to hide out of the world for, for, for quite some time. Uh, whether it's a jazz vocal, whether it's a spiritual in a Baptist church, uh, whether it's uh, an incredible, I mean, Sangomas are, are traditional healers in, in South Africa and um, central to the ceremony is music and drum and, and, and just the sheer repetition of it um, sort of, you know, conjures up obviously uh, spiritual uh, reactions uh, or whether it's, it's Mozart or Strauss or Verdi, uh, you know, it's music and it's just, it's exceptional and beautiful when it's done well. Strauss in his opera Ariadne of Noxo says, and I'm mangling the German a bit from memory, Musik ist ein heilige Kunst. Music is a holy art form. And it's sung by a character called the composer. And um, it's true. I also subscribe, one of the patron saints in my household growing up was Duke Ellington, who I did meet. Mm -hmm. 
And um, I went to his funeral because I live on 94th Street and he lived on 110th. And the funeral was held in the church of St. John the Divine and Ella Fitzgerald sang at the funeral. It's a huge church. And um, Duke Ellington said there are only two types of music, good music and the other kind. Mm -hmm. And he did not make any distinctions in terms of genre. You know good music when you hear it. And it just does it for you, whether it's Bill Withers or Aretha Franklin or Mozart's Cosi Fantute, whatever it is that moves you. Uh, to me, uh, South African choruses, Black Lady Smith Mombazo, that sound just it washes over me happiness and contentment and serenity and, and growth. And, you know, thankfully, we have electronic media that can bring this music, uh, whether through disc, whether through Internet whether through radio. I told you at the very beginning of our conversation that my very dear friend who was born and grew up in Johannesburg and lives now in the United States told me that radio, I'm reading her comments, radio plays a huge role in the listening habits of South Africans. And it's interesting because now radio elsewhere in the world, while still important, has been taken over a bit by podcasting and streaming and all kinds of other forms. You are a radio man. You are a leading figure in radio in South Africa. You're heard nationally. Would you talk about radio and then how you got into it, but about the role of radio in South Africa in terms of musical taste and information and so forth? I agree with your friend. Uh, radio is the primary source of uh, information and entertainment in South Africa. And, and here we're talking about terrestrial radio where you need to, you know, wind it to a dial and listen through uh, the traditional uh, form of, uh, of broadcast. Um, and, and that is still primarily my listener. So uh, the, the broadcast company that I work for is called Prime Media Broadcasting. Um, I, in Cape Town, there's a talk radio station called Cape Talk and in Johannesburg, it's called 702. And I'm lucky enough to be able to broadcast to both. So my show is simulcast to, to, both, to both cities. So I've got both of the two main markets. Uh, I broadcast in the early hours of between four and six in the morning. And I, I get the listener ready, if you like, for, for, for their day. Um, we are a station. And, and it's true of the public broadcaster, the SABC, and uh, the myriad of community radio stations that exist everywhere uh, in the country. Um, when, when, you, when you hear something, what do you do? You turn to the radio for confirmation. Um, social media is bereft with disinformation, as we know, and we're certainly seeing it, unfortunately, with, uh, uh, with, with, with the pandemic. Um, I mean, your former president, Trump, is still sowing news of elections. I've never school. heard of that name. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we had Obama and Biden, and I don't remember four years in between. <laughs> but, but radio is very much the primary source of, of information and entertainment. And once again, uh, a thrill, a joy, a uh, uh, just delightful to be able to have serious conversations. We, we've just concluded uh, what's called local government elections, which are separate from the national elections. So here we're determining municipalities and councils that run cities. Um, and for the first time in the history of our democracy, we've had 66 hung councils, including uh, five of the big metros, right? So the city of Joburg, the biggest metro in the country, city of Tswane, where the capital city uh, is, the city of Kurulin, where uh, the main international airport and businesses around, all of them hung. So now there's the uh, coalition agreements that are taking place and frustratingly slow. Um, the listeners are gonna turn to me at 10 minutes past five in the morning to help them make sense of their world. That, that's my responsibility, which thankfully I take seriously and many of my colleagues do, which is why they keep on coming back and, and listening. Uh, podcasts are um, going up in popularity. Uh, sadly, the cost of bandwidth in South Africa is still exorbitant. So it becomes a, um, a barrier uh, for people to be able to, to access it. Uh, you generally find, as I imagine it's the same in the United States, that it's the urban environments that, that, that have the take up of podcasts more so than the rural um, uh, environments. Um, and 
a number of my friends will have a series of podcasts that they listen to regularly, but they'll know uh, at seven o'clock in the morning, I must tune into that particular radio station because I'm going to hear the bit of news, the song, the joke of the day, whatever the case may be that I need at that time to make my day uh, a little a little easier. Um, we, were, we were in Australia in Sydney about oh, 12 years ago now. Uh, we were on a 10 day sort of radio listening exercise because our consultants at the time came from Australia and both uh, my colleague John Matham and I um, literally spent 10 days with earphones and walking the streets of uh, Sydney uh, while we're listening to radio. And at the time they were recalling our president, uh, former president Tabo Megi, uh, which was a, a horrible time in terms of, you know, he was eight months to the conclusion of his term, but because he'd lost out the leadership battle within his own party, they then recalled him. Um, that very same time, they were talking about a rugby player who had um, escaped, escaped is not the word, but decided to leave to go to France in Australia. And the other big talking point was people who'd gone to this massive function and there was not enough parking and they were fined. That's the conversation that we're having. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that Australia is not complex and dynamic. It certainly is. But in South Africa, every day, there's something that we need to talk about. I yearn, I pray for a boring day where I'm left to talk about the weather and nothing else. But sadly, there's, there's as I said, we're only 27 years into this democracy. And every day feels like you know, work needs to be done. And it's, it's the work of my colleagues, both in talk radio, uh, music radio, commercial, public radio, community radio stations, who alongside our colleagues in television and in newspapers have the responsibility of informing our public of what's going on and in the process, hopefully help them make sense of the world. So are your broadcasts streamed? And I ask that because this would mean yeah. that we in the Americas can listen to you as our evening broadcast. Indeed. So we have apps, uh, Cape Talk, which is one word, and 702 are the two um, apps that you can search for on your app store. Otherwise, the URL, www.capetalk.co.za, uh, 702.co.za, and then you'll be able to list, uh, I mean, if you went there now, after obviously watching this wonderful podcast, um, you can go and listen and hear what South Africans are talking about right now. So what does 702 mean? It's the um, uh, dial on the frequency. Um, okay. So 702 used to be on medium wave and, and the frequency was 702. And actually there's an interesting story to 702. Um, Swaziland is a neighboring country. It's now called Eswatini. And sadly, there's a lot of conflict that is happening there. It's the last absolute monarch on the African continent. And there's a fight for democracy, um, which unfortunately has been met by force. And uh, the South African president, Cyril Ramaphosa, in his capacity as uh, the head of the regional um, defense and human rights troika, as they call it, uh, is having to intervene there. And uh, South Africans are frustrated that he's not intervening forcefully enough and, and deliberately enough. Um, anyway, Eswatini had the original license to broadcast what we call 702. And uh, post-1948, when the Nationalist Party formed the apartheid government, um, only 10% of the land in South Africa was allocated to black people who made up 90% of the population. And they created what was called uh, Bantu stats, right? Which were yes. semi-autonomous regions in South Africa dotted everywhere. And so our very first signal tower was in one of those Bantu stats. So mm -hmm. people in Joburg could listen to the real news and hear reports on the ground of what was happening in South Africa. And the only reason we could get away with it is because it was a license that belonged to a neighboring country from a signal that was broadcast in a semi-autonomous region in South Africa. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the station now is more than 40 years old and it's still certainly in Johannesburg relied on as a main source of news and analysis because that becomes an, an essential part of it. Uh, so this happened today, w what does it mean? here, let's, let's unpack this and engage with you in terms of how you're feeling about it. So the 702 is, is the signal um, on the medium wave uh, spectrum that people will need to dial into to, to be able to listen to the station. So final question, although I know you and I could go on at Wagnerian length for hours and hours and hours, and I would love to do that again with you. Um, does South Africa 
given its love for radio, have broadcasting of operas from not only Cape Town Opera, but perhaps European. There's the European Broadcast Union. There is the Metropolitan Opera Broadcast that comes every Saturday here at one in the afternoon, so eight o'clock in South Africa. Do you have classical radio and opera on the on a station? Uh, we certainly do. Um, it, it, unfortunately, in diminishing numbers, uh, Cape Town, once again, likely lucky enough to have a community radio station called Fine Music Radio. And about 50% of the programming is um, uh, classical music. So orchestra as well as opera and they certainly would 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 play music not only recorded in South Africa we don't have a lot of um, professional recordings if you like uh, so I would say 80% of the operatic pieces that we play are often um, from companies in America and companies in in Europe and there's an audience that is sustained that that absolutely loves it uh, the other 50% of the time they're broadcasting jazz and it's just beautiful beautiful jazz and and they tend to break it up in that way where from hours a to b it's classical music and from hours b to you know to Z, I suppose, uh, it's going to be jazz music. Um, the public broadcaster has a news and, and talk station called uh, SAFM, South African FM. Uh, and on a Sunday, or is it a Saturday, I believe, uh, there is an allocation of two hours uh, of uh, primarily orchestral music um, that, uh, that is broadcast to South Africa. Uh, South Africa has a rich history of choral music, uh, um, there's a reason why uh, the chorus of Cape Town Opera uh, won an award <laughs> worldwide because yeah. we literally come from, from chorus music. So one of the vernacular uh, stations in Togo and for example, on a Saturday would have a, a full hour of recorded choral music from choirs in South Africa. And a lot of that repertoire is, is Western. It's operatic, it's a Mozart, a Wagner, whatever uh, the case may be. Um, so, so there is classical music on radio, not to the extent or the amount that I would love because I always yearn it. Um, but then when, when the radio is not playing it, uh, one finds it on platforms like this. Does K-10 Opera record its performances? They could possibly be broadcast later on? Uh, yes. So uh, even pre-pandemic, uh, we would often film uh, the, the work that we're doing. And of course, with that comes a fantastic sound system that we'd have to uh, bring in uh, to, uh, to record the quality of, of the sound. Uh, and post-pandemic, every production we've mounted has been filmed um, and then would be edited and uh, would be made available at uh, a, later, a later time. Uh, we're lucky in the sense that uh, we are one of the associated companies, as we called, in the Artscape. So it's us, it's a ballet company, the orchestra company, and then two dance companies, uh, Jazz Art and Unmute. And the Artscape building itself, like the State uh, Theatre in Pretoria, is an agency of the National Department of Arts and Culture. So we are able to enjoy favourable rates um, in terms of rental of not only office space, but obviously when we are on the stages and the resources that come with that, that are provided by, by the Artscape. So we augment, uh, supplement uh, what they make available by then putting in a rig that will be able to not only film, but record uh, the, the amazing sound uh, that, that is available. Uh, we don't have an extensive library as yet, we're building on it, um, but, but we, certainly, we certainly have some recorded uh, material, yeah. In my experience, ballet is not very interesting on the radio, so that you have an advantage in the opera company. <laughs> we certainly do. People. <laughs> no, we certainly do. Um, the, the Cape Philharmonic, actually, uh, the orchestra company uh, probably has the most advantage because one, they've been around for more than 100 years. They were celebrating, is it 120 years? I can't remember, but they've been around the longest of the classical performing arts companies. Um, and of course, they get to play for both us, the uh, opera company, as well as the ballet company. Mm. So while you might not be able to see the dancing um, from music recorded for a ballet, you can certainly hear the orchestra playing that music. And that's often reflected on, uh, on, um, on fine music radio, for example, and stuff like that. I remember I said I was going to talk to you a bit about South African wine. I was a good close friend of a South African tenor named Dion Vandervelt, who was Afrikaans, 
who grew up in the wine producing Stellenbosch, I think it's called district of South Africa and Mm -hmm. had a wonderful winery. And he and I would do presentations in New York because in another life in 2010, I was America's wine journalist of the year. So I do care about wine. And so he and I, he died unfortunately in very tragic circumstances. He and I did presentations where he would sing Mozart and then he would sing music from South Africa and we would serve the wines and I would talk about his wines and the grapes and the and the process. Typically when I talk about wine, it's about places I've been to, but mm-hmm. in this case, I've never been to South Africa yet. Um, <laughs> but it's really wonderful wine. Uh, is it, you have a wine bar scene in Cape Town, it sounds like, and it's mostly South African wines. No, we do. We do. I, I'm a teetotaler myself. I, 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 I serve. I mean, if I were to move the camera to the one part of my house, you'd see uh, the beginnings of a cellar because I do love to entertain and I and I serve I serve a wine extensively. Um, we we I'm biased. We have some of the best wines in the world, without a <laughs> doubt. Um, a significant portion of it actually exported, but unfortunately not in the in the volumes that would would. I think we still have potential to to export even more. Um, And each of the regions uh, brings with it a particular um, uh, uniqueness in terms of uh, appreciation, taste, um, notes that come through. Uh, Stellenbosch, for example, uh, is is very well known. Franchuk is an incredible valley uh, with not only exquisite wine, but outstanding food. Some of the best restaurants uh, in South Africa come from, from Franchuk. Uh, there's another one called Himmel in Arde, which is in um, Hermanus, which is just the beginning of the Southern Cape. There must be about 10 or 12 estates there, but they do some of the best Pinot Noir you are ever going to enjoy in South Africa. Um, and a lot of it for export, but some of it available in South Africa. And then you've got the Cedar and the West Coast, which has a very different taste altogether. Um, so the bulk of the wine in South Africa will come from, from Cape Town and the wine regions around here. Um, KwaZulu Natal has a little bit of wine, even Johannesburg has some wine estates, but uh, uh, I don't know of anybody who, speak of, <laughs> who speaks of wine that comes from those regions, but everybody speaks of wine that comes from um, certainly the, the wine, the Stellenbosch's, Franchuk's, the Cedarbergs, Hemel and Arde of, this, of, of these worlds. Um, we have the Method Cup Classique, which is our version of, of Champagne. Uh, the, the delightful uh, Mrs. Obama, who was your first lady, uh, chose one of our wine estates to be served at the inauguration celebrations. I uh, can't remember whether it was the first one or the second one, but uh, you know, the, the, the wine estate in question, Graham Beck, always celebrates the fact that they're there. Stienberg in the, uh, in the peninsula, oh, some incredible, I mean, I don't drink, but even I know how good <laughs> some of these wines are because of what people feed back uh, to me. Um, so not only will you be able to enjoy incredible music when you come to South Africa, uh, you so the broadband went a little glitchy. Let's see when you come back. There you are, Africa. Can you hear me now? Nod yes or no? I can hear you very oh good. Very, okay. very, I can hear you very clearly. Okay. So final, final question for now, although I know we could continue to the length of the Meisterzinger, six hours. Um I've never asked about South Africa, and I've asked you about your constitution. As a teetotaler, is South Africa more a coffee-drinking country or a tea-drinking country? Oh, wow. That's a very good one. Uh, Cape Town, uh, certainly more coffee-drinking. Um, at some point, we had up to 64 roasteries uh, in Cape Town that were, were, were often importing beans from other parts of Africa uh, and then roasting them themselves and of course grinding them and making them available both for uh, on-site consumption where you buy your cappuccino and you drink it um, but primarily for commercial use where restaurants and you know uh, hotels and all of that uh, get to buy the coffee so I would say Cape Town more coffee certainly now than they are tea drinkers. For the, for the rest of South Africa, um, possibly tea wins the day, where perhaps the palate for coffee 
coffee is not as refined as I find it to be in Cape Town. You could literally decide, I want notes of apple and pine in my coffee. And you'll know exactly where to go to in order for you to find those notes of apple and pine in your coffee that you have in your cup. I would imagine that Durban with its large population from India is more tea oriented, even though India is a large producer of coffee. And this will be just another thing that I will study when I finally get to drink coffee with you in person in Cape Town and tea, perhaps when we go to Durban or Johannesburg. No doubt. Africa, of course, you will find the best curry in Durban. I mean, hands down. We, we, have, we have curry in Cape Town that is informed by uh, the Malaysian uh, sort of influence because we have a history of slavery in Cape Town and uh, there's a population of Cape Malay, as they called, uh, who have uh, generally a more sweetened curry, uh, pungent and quite sort of strong in, in strength. So the Wi-Fi has frozen again. And once it liberates, then I will say goodbye to my new friend, Africa Milane. I don't know if you can hear me. I can hear you very clearly. Okay. <laughs> you were in a very dramatic operatic gesture. You froze. <laughs> Anyway, get get to enjoy. I, yeah. I mentioned earlier that we've got a lot of wind in Cape Town. That that's why the connectivity is a little bit unstable at times. Okay, so Africa Milani, my new friend, it was really a pleasure to get to know you and meet you via streaming. And thanks to Idajo, and keep up all the good work that you and all of your colleagues are doing in South Africa for music for art and culture and political discussion every day. And I look forward to the day when we can sit across one another and have a curry, have some coffee. I don't need wine. And, <laughs> um, <laughs> and continue our conversation. Be well and thank you. Thank you very much, Fred. Thank you for this invitation. It's been a wonderful, wonderful conversation and I'm a great follower of your work. It's such an honor to be here and I can't wait to host